In the last video, we looked at degrees of freedom and constraints. In this video, we're going to take a more detailed look at constraints and we'll split them into two types, holonomic and non-holonomic. Now to understand these two types of constraints, it's best seen by example. So in the first page here, we're going to look at holonomic constraints. So let's take, for example, a disc, which you see here in blue, and it can roll in only one direction. That is this direction here. So it can roll forward and it can roll backwards. And let's say this direction here is the x direction. So there's only one degree of freedom here, which is in this direction. Now let's say, for example, we have a little point in pink here. And if, whenever the disc rolls, this little point in pink rolls around with it. Now we want to know the position of this little pink dot. So if we were to take the radius of the disc as R, and the angle at which the disc, this dot rolls, is an angle theta, then we can see that the arc that it generates here, which is given by a value of x, is simply given by x is equal to r theta. So we're just, just, just assuming that theta is in radians. Now, we can rewrite this in terms of infinitesimals. We could say that dx, that is a small displacement here in the x direction, is equal to the value of r, which is the radius, times a small angular displacement theta. Now we could take this over to the other side and we have we could have dx minus rd theta is equal to zero. Now we can take this equation here and in effect this is our equation of constraint and we can integrate this up. So if we integrate the dx and we can integrate the uh, rd theta and that's going to give us a value of c. Okay, so c is just going to be the constant of integration. So when we integrate this up, we're just going to be left with our x minus r theta is equal to a value of c. Now the value of c is nothing other than the initial starting point for this dot. So we could define the initial condition of the dot at that point there, and we could call the value of c zero. And that's why we don't have it up here. We could alternatively just add the extra value of c in here. So if you like, you can think about this value of c as the, an initial displacement or a, a phase angle. But really, from this example here, what we're interested in is the fact that we can tell the position of this little pink dot if we know the distance along the x-axis. So if we know the value for x, we know the value for r, we can find the value for theta. It's simply x is equal to r theta. We know x, we know r, we can find theta. We find theta, we know the position of this little pink dot. So in this example here, there's one degree of freedom, which is our value of our x. And there's only one parameter that we need in order to define the position of this little pink dot. And that parameter is nothing other than our value of x, which is our degree of freedom. Now we could write that out more generally if we replace the value of x with our value for qi, which is going to be our generalized coordinate. So the main point we can take from this example here is that if we were to take our equation of constraint and integrate it up, then we're going to be left with a function here which is purely a function of position. And we can write it more generally and say that our equation of constraint is purely a function of our generalized coordinate qi. Now the second one we're going to look at here is really just the same as the first one, but we're going to add in the factor of time. So not only is this disc rolling in this direction, 
it's rolling at a particular rate. So we can say here in this example, we're going to start off with x as a function of time is equal to r times theta as a function of time. So that means that we can rewrite this in terms of infinitesimals as dx by dt is equal to r d theta by dt, or if you like, you'll see that written sometimes as x dot equals r times uh, theta dot. So we can take this over to the other side, and we're left with our dx by dt minus r d theta by dt is equal to zero. Now, again, in this instance here, we can take this equation of constraint and we can integrate it up. So if we were to integrate this here, we would have the integral of dx by dt all by dt minus r d theta by dt all by dt. So the dt's cancel. And again, we're going to be left with our x minus r theta is equal to our constant c, which is the same as what we have above here. So this means that our equation of constraint in this instance here has got time derivatives of position. But whenever we integrate it up, we're still left with only the function of position. There's no function of time here. So as long as these time derivatives can be integrated up, giving us only a function of our uh, position here, then we say that the constraints are holonomic. So we can say more generally from this example here that our holonomic constraints can be a function of our generalised coordinates and also time. So finally, for a holonomic system, the number of parameters that we require in order to define the system is equal to the number of degrees of freedom. So in this instance here, there's only one degree of freedom, which is the motion in this direction here. And there's only one parameter required in order to define this pink dot. And that parameter here in this instance here is our value of our x. So our degree of freedom, x, is our parameter that we use in order to define the system. Now that's not always the case, and we'll see whenever we look in the next slide that non-holonomic systems don't behave like this. Now let's look at a non-holonomic example. We have a ball here which is free to roll on top of a table, so it can roll in the x plane and also the y plane. At this point here, I've drawn a dot which is facing upwards. Now the ball can roll in any random fashion and let's say it ends up at this point here, in which case this pink dot will be facing in a different direction. Now if the ball is allowed to both roll in the xy plane and also slide in the xy plane, then it's going to have five degrees of freedom. It's going to have the x and the y and it's also going to have the three angles, theta, phi, and psi. Now, if we prevent the ball from sliding, and we only allow the ball to roll on the table, then it's only, to, only going to have two degrees of freedom. It's going to have the x direction and the y direction. So in the case of the rolling ball only, we might expect to be able to write the other angles, theta, phi, and psi, as some functions of the x and y. So when we looked at the holonomic example in the previous slide, we've seen that we were able to derive a differential form for a constraint. So this is an example here. And this is the second example that we did for the differential form of the constraint for the holonomic system. And we said that we're going to have one parameter for each degree of freedom. So in the simple holonomic example, the parameter was our x and the degree of freedom was also our x direction.
Now in this non-holonomic example, we have two degrees of freedom, but we have another three parameters. The parameters are our theta, phi and psi. So we might hope to be able to write these parameters, theta, phi and psi, in terms of our values of x and y. So what we want to be able to do is generate the constraints in differential form for our d theta. So our d theta is going to be some function of our dx, which is our first degree of freedom, and it's going to be some function of our dy, which is our other degree of freedom. And we'd hope to be able to do the same for our d phi and our d psi. And then we would want to be able to integrate these up so that we could integrate this function and integrate this one and integrate this function. And this would finally give us our value of our theta as a function of x and y, our phi as a function of x and y, and our psi as a function of x and y. And in effect, that would be solve our problem. We would have done the same process with the non-holonomic system as we'd have done with the holonomic system. And we would have had only two degrees of freedom and the other three parameters, we could write them out as the functions of those degrees of freedom. But it turns out that we just cannot do this. So let's see in the next slide why this is the case. So if this were true, that we could write our angular displacement theta, phi and psi in terms of our x and y, then it would mean that the position of a point on a ball rolling in a 2D surface would be given by only the, its initial orientation and its final x and y position. And that is not what happens. And we'll see that just in a minute when we do the experiment with a ball with a little dot on it. So that means that we don't have a set of functions f of qi of coordinates uh, that we get by integrating a set of differential constraints. Turns out we only have constraints between the infinitesimal values f qi dot. So that means that in fact that we need more parameters in a non-holonomic system than we have degrees of freedom. So let's go ahead and we'll have a wee look at this experiment now. Okay, so we're going to start off with our ball here and you can see I've drawn a dot on the top of the ball. So you can go and try this uh, yourself as well. And I'll put a mark for the beginning uh, uh, on the table. So this is an old table and it's a I can rub this mark off. So we'll start at that point there and we'll finish up at another point, say up here. So if we start at that point here, we're going to have an initial orientation, okay? So uh, this point here is pointing directly upwards, although it might not look like that from the video. So that points directly upwards, so that's our original orientation of the ball. And we're going to move the ball from this point here to this point here, and we're going to check and see where the orientation is. So obviously I can move this around in any path without slipping. I can move it around in any path that I want. And I can get a new orientation for the dot. Now the dot's actually around here and it's facing this direction, okay? So there it's there, it's facing this direction. So now I could pick that same point again with the same orientation and I can use a different path. So if I move it up along this path here, again, no slipping, just rolling, then I could get a whole new orientation for this point. So there's a point here and it's facing this direction. So it means that we've been able to show there quite simply from this little experiment that the orientation of the dot on the ball is not dependent on its original orientation and its x and y position. So we're going to treat holonomic and non-holonomic systems differently and you'll see that over the next few videos. So thank you for listening. 
I'll get you on the next video. Goodbye.